To my YouTube listeners, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please subscribe. It'll make a big difference for the Hasidic Story Project. This is the Hasidic Story Project with Barack Holman, podcasting from Jerusalem, Israel. This podcast is sponsored by listeners just like you. To become a supporter of this podcast, please go to HasidicStory.com. H-A-S-I-D-I-C Story.com. You'll never know. You'll never know, you'll never know, you'll never know. In the time of the third Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Tzemach Tzedek who lived in Russia, all of the lands in which the Jews lived were controlled by a Poritz, a baron, a non-Jewish landlord who normally issued cruel decrees against the Jewish people. And one time... There was a Poritz that made a decree that was so hard on the Jewish people that the Tzemach Tzedek decided it was time to intervene. Normally, the Poritz, if he needed money for his parties or he was just bored, he would decree something and somehow the Jewish people would get together the money and pay the Poritz. But now, it was so bad that even the non-Jews came to the Tzemach Tzedek and begged the Rebbe to help them because the Poritz had just gone out of his mind. And at the same time, that the non-Jews came to the Tzemach Tzedek asking for help, there happened to be a Chassid standing there in the room, one of the closest Chassidim of the Tzemach Tzedek. And so the Tzemach Tzedek says to the non-Jews, don't worry, Be'ezat Hashem, me and this Chassid here, we're going to take care of things. So the Chassid's looking at the Rebbe like, Rebbe, what do you mean, me and the Chassid? You're a Rebbe, you're a Tzadik, maybe you can take care of things, but what am I supposed to do with the Poritz? So the delegation of non-Jews leaves, and the Rebbe turns to the Chassid and he says, Why do you look so nervous? And the Chassid said, Rebbe, I'm a little concerned about what you're about to send me off to do. And the Rebbe said, Listen, you're going to go to the Poritz, and you're going to tell him, In my name, it's time that you changed. So the Chassid looks at the Rebbe, and he feels like he's about to faint. It was difficult for him to breathe. He was getting dizzy. Maybe he misunderstood what the Rebbe said, and he said, Rebbe, can you say that again? Because if I understood what you were saying, that you want me, a chassid, a Jew, to go to the Poritz, who has control over our lives and our land, and can shoot me on the spot, and no one would care, you want me to go there and tell him it's time that you changed? And the Rebbe said, you know, what kind of chassid are you? First of all, if you have a muna, if you have faith in the Rebbe, then you have nothing to worry about. But Rebbe, don't you understand? There's guards at the door. Like, scary guards, big guards, and they have dogs. And the Poritz has a gun. And who knows what'll happen? So the Rebbe said, listen, don't worry. I'm going to teach you a special holy name, Shem Hashem, a Kabbalistic word of Hashem's name that will protect you from all evil. You have nothing to worry about. First of all, you're a chassid. And second, I'm sending you on a special mission. So the chassid realized he didn't have any choice. It wasn't like he was going to say, Rebbe, I'm not going to go. The Rebbe gives the Chassid a mission, the Chassid goes, and that's that. So the Rebbe taught the Chassid how to pronounce the special word, and what to think, the thoughts to have when he said it. And then he practiced. And when he was sure that the Chassid understood and would remember the name, he told him, go say bye to your wife and kids, and go right now. So the Chassid was still quite nervous, even though he knew that he should have had the level of faith where his heart would be calm and his mind would be calm, but he wasn't there yet. And so he went home, hoped it wouldn't be the last time he was coming home. Then he told his wife that he had business to do for the Rebbe and that he'd be back in a few days' time. He kissed his children goodbye, gave them all a bracha, and then headed off in the direction of the Poritz's castle. After a few hours of walking, he could see the castle coming up in the distance through the trees. And he started getting really concerned. He tried to remember the name that the Rebbe had taught him, and the kavanot and the intentions that he was supposed to have when he said the name, and everything seemed to be clear, but still he wasn't sure that it would really work. I mean, those guards and those dogs looked pretty scary. And so he pictures the Rebbe's face and continues walking towards the castle. As soon as he got close enough that he could really see the guards and the dogs, he decided to hide behind a tree. And since he was downwind, the dogs couldn't smell him. And he's thinking again of the name that the Rebbe taught him, and he starts saying it quietly to himself. 
And eventually the dogs came over to him. They'd start sniffing around. But they don't see him, and they simply walk past the chassid as if he wasn't there. But the chassid, knowing, okay, yes, the Rebbe gave me a special segula, a special tool in order to be safe, but still, I'm not taking any chances. I'll wait for those dogs to go far away before I approach the castle. And when he saw that the dogs were far, and it seemed like things were quiet, he slowly walked towards the castle, repeating the name again and again as he went. And finally, he had reached the steps of the castle and starts walking up them. At the top of the steps were two huge guards with spears and swords, and each of them had a big dog standing next to them. And with each step, he repeated the holy name again and again, telling himself, I'm a chassid, I believe in the Rebbe, and I believe that the Rebbe is a tzaddik, and if the Rebbe sent me here, then he did it for a good reason, and I can do this. And he's repeating the name, and finally he's standing there right in front of the guards. The dogs are right there, and instead of attacking him, or even seeing him, the dogs just laid there, panting, as if nothing was happening. And the guards were talking with one another. They didn't even notice the chassid. So the chassid slowly walked past them and gently opened the huge door of the castle and went inside. As he walked up more steps looking for the ports, there were more guards and more dogs and just like the first ones, they didn't see him at all. Finally, he walks into the ports' room and he sees him sitting on a throne, drinking a glass of vodka and smoking a cigar. And he looks at the chassid and he says, What? How? A Jew? How did you get into my castle? And he jumps up on his feet and he puts his hand on his gun. But the chassid at this point, he wasn't scared for one second. He was repeating the name again and again. He said to the poets, You listen to me right now. And the poets was so shocked. He didn't know what to do. And the chassid said, My Rebbe, the Tzemach Tzedek of Lubavitch, he sent me, and he told me to tell you that. And then the chassid cleared his throat. <coughs> it's time for you to change. The poets looked completely shocked. It was as if the floor had opened up underneath him. He took his hand off the gun, and he looked at the chassid, and he said, What did you just say? And the chassid stood up straight, and he said, My Rebbe, Tzemach Tzedek, he told me to come here and tell you it's time for you to change. And the poet, he sat back down in his chair, and he kind of collapsed into his chair. And he said to the chassid, you can go now. Just like you came in, may you leave. Goodbye. And so the chassid turns around, and he starts walking out, repeating the name that the Rebbe had given him again and again. And as soon as he was out of the castle and safe, he tried to repeat the name, but he couldn't remember it. No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't even remember one letter of the name. And so he realized that his mission for the Rebbe was over, and he happily went back home to his wife and children. About six months later, there was a rumor that the Poritz had gone on a hunting trip, all by himself with his horse, and the horse returned a few days later without him. And no matter how hard they tried, no one could seem to find the Poritz. It was as if he had disappeared from the face of the earth. And the Chassid figured it must have been the punishment that God gave to the Poritz through the message that he delivered from the Rebbe, because that Poritz had caused so much suffering to so many people. Good riddance. We were all happy that he was gone. And about six months after that, a beggar shows up in the town of Lubavitch with dirty, torn clothes and long hair and a long beard. And he comes and he sits down in a seat in the main shul, opens up a book of Tehillim, and starts saying psalms. And he's saying them for hours and hours and hours, just sitting there. So eventually, someone got the idea that maybe this guy, who'd been traveling around, would know what happened to the Poritz. So someone went and said, hey, do you know what happened to the Poritz? And the beggar said, yes, I do, as a matter of fact. He said, I'm the Poritz. So the Hasidim there, they said, what are you talking about, you're the Poritz? First of all, you're a beggar, and the Poritz is rich. And second, you're a Jew. And the Poritz is a goy. So the beggar says, listen, I'll tell you my story. I was born into a Jewish family, but my parents died when I was young, and nobody knew what to do with me. So the church took me in, and they raised me as a Christian, even though 
I knew that I was a Jew, but those were my parents. The church raised me, and they taught me to hate Jews. And so not only was I a good Christian, I also hated Jews. And eventually, I became very rich, became the poorest, and I did exactly as I was taught when I was growing up, took out all my anger on the Jews. But when that chassid came to me that day, he touched my Jewish neshama, touched my soul, and he changed me. I realized that I couldn't remain somebody that I wasn't really. And so I left. I disappeared. And I found a community far away. I started learning again what it is to be a Jew. And eventually, I became a Hasid as well. So word spread quickly in Lubavitch. And when the elder Hasidim in Lubavitch heard what the Rebbe had done for the Poritz, a group of them went to the Rebbe, the Tzemach Tzedek. And they said, if the Rebbe is able to completely change Someone like the Poritz, who hated us with all of his heart, and didn't even grow up a Jew even though he was one, then what could the Rebbe do for us? We that are Hasidim, and our hearts are open, and we love and fear Hashem. Rebbe, please do for us what you did for the Poritz. And the Rebbe smiled at his Hasidim, and he said, Tell me, when a shepherd tends his flocks, he can't personally run after every single animal that runs away because that would exhaust him. Instead, he has a flute or he throws some stones or sends a dog that'll bring the flock back. But if every now and then one of the sheep falls into a deep pit and the shepherd has no choice, he has to go and pull that sheep out by himself. <coughs> and so you all are my sheep. And when you stray a little bit, so I give you guidance to come back. But when one of you, like the Poritz, falls into a deep pit, then the Rebbe has no choice but to pull him out himself. One more little vortile for the days of tshuva. A chassid once came to his rebbe, the great rebbe, Rebbe Yisrael Levuzhin, and he said, Rebbe, I've committed all kinds of transgressions, and I want to do tshuva. So the great tzaddik, he said to the chassid, okay, why haven't you done tshuva yet? And the chassid said, well, rebbe, I don't know how to do tshuva. So the rebbe said, well, how did you do the avera? How did you do the transgression? And the chassid said, that was easy, I just did it. And so the tzaddik said, so that's how you do tshuva. Just like you did the transgression, so do the tshuva. And one more thing, my sweetest friends. If you haven't checked out the other stories related to this time of the year, there's two beautiful stories, some of my favorites. If you go to my website, hasidicstory.com, H-A-S-I-D-I-C story.com, you'll see there's a category for slichot stories. Story 37, we Jews have enough enemies. And story 85, really one of my favorite, favorite, favorites, if not higher. Make sure to check those out and have a Shana Tova Metuka, my sweetest friends. A sweet and good year of revealed good and sweetness so sweet that you can taste it in your mouth. <laughs>